So with the great drama of John Brown, uh, putting it aside for a minute, let's talk about the more conventional, boring politics of 1860. Brown is executed in December 1859. 1860 rolls around, presidential election. Republican prospects look pretty good. They've swept to great victories in 1858. The economy is still in bad shape. There's a whole series of new economic issues which are helping them, the Homestead Act, uh, their belief in a, some belief in a tariff, not really that much, but certainly for Pennsylvania iron, they talk about that. But they still need, they still need to get themselves organized to carry the so-called doubtful, the lower north states. One Republican politician says, I am for the man who will carry Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Indiana. With this reservation, I will not go into the cemetery. The candidate must be alive and able to walk at least from the parlor into the dining room. Other than that, if he can win the doubtful states, let's nominate him. Well, the leading candidate for the Republican nomination is William Seward, the greatest Republican leader of the 1850s. But he had the liability of a long political career in which he had made a lot of enemies. Um, and said a lot of things. Often we nominate people who have not much political experience, like President Obama when he was nominated. In a certain, and it's sort of like they go to an extreme like this with Supreme Court justices now. They're not supposed to say anything about anything in order to get themselves nominated. So the less you've said, the better in some way. But anyway, Seward had a long career. He was known universally as the leading Republican. He was the presumptive nominee. But he, was, he had a reputation, not 100% deserved, for excessive radicalism, or at least enough radicalism that the doubtful states, Illinois, Indiana, he might not be able to carry them. Um, the know-nothings, the know-nothing element in the Republican Party strongly disliked Seward because, as I've mentioned, 20 years before, as governor, he had tried to work with Archbishop Hughes of New York City in order to get support for Catholic schools and trying to bring Catholics into the Whig party. The know-nothings didn't like that very much. Uh, and many former Democrats in the, in the uh, Republican party didn't like Seward because they'd had long battles with him. So Seward has great strength and great liabilities. There are other candidates, but all of them have problems. Salmon P. Chase, the governor of um, Ohio is equally radical, more radical, really, than Seward, um, and um, also thought to be rather, uh, how shall I put it, vain, excessive vanity. They said of him that he was very religious, but he had a faulty the theology. He thought there were four persons in the Trinity. <laughs> um, on the other end was um, Bates, Edward Bates of Missouri, who was a a candidate of conservative Republicans, but he wasn't even a Republican. He had voted for the Know Nothings in 1856. Uh, he was anti the expansion of slavery, but the German element, which is significant in the Northwest, would certainly not uh, be, would not like uh, Bates. Um, Lincoln was not the first choice of almost anybody except Illinois, but Lincoln had this he had this wonderful strategic location. He was not offensive to anybody. He was acceptable to all, he was like the second choice of all these different candidates, supporters. He'd been out of office, so he hadn't built up a giant career of, uh, that people could pick on. He was acceptable to the know-nothings, but also to the German voters. He was not a know-nothing, but uh, he didn't have a long history of fighting them like, um, like Seward did. Um, so he had, you know, as I say, he was like the second choice of a lot of people. And, um, and, this, and the convention met in Chicago. Now, the reason it met in Chicago was when they had decided in 1859 where the Republican convention should meet, they decided to pick a neutral spot. No one thought Lincoln was a candidate. Couldn't do New York because that would help Seward. Couldn't do Ohio because that would help Chase. Put it in Chicago. Suddenly, a favorite son is there, Lincoln, as a candidate, and this is the first convention in which the sort of public, the, 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 the spectators at the convention actually influence the result. The Lincoln, Lincoln's guys 
packed the convention hall, the so-called wigwam, a great auditorium built for this, uh, not in the most up, uh, upper, you know, up and up way. They printed thousands of phony tickets and got their guys in first. So then when the Seward guys turn up, there's no room for them because all the seats are taken by the Lincoln guys with their phony tickets. Um, and they brought in a guy who, I don't know if this is true, they claim could shout across Lake Michigan. So when Lincoln was put into nomination, the voice of the people was heard to tremendous uh, uproar there. Um, but anyway, the, the, despite the great drama which, which uh, the writers about Lincoln imbued this with, it actually was all very simple. The night before the convention met, the so-called doubtful states, Pennsylvania, Indiana, etc., they met and they decided, we can't have Seward, Lincoln is the guy. And with them rallying behind Lincoln, Seward could not get the nomination. And very quickly, uh, on the third ballot, Lincoln was nominated. Um, Seward's strength was confined to what we call the upper north, New England, um, New York State, of course, Michigan, et cetera. Seward was ahead, but he could never get a majority because there were enough Republicans who just thought he couldn't win their states. The Republican platform differed from that of 1856 because it introduced some of these economic issues. It talked about the need for a homestead, free land in the West. It talked about building a Pacific Railroad. It talked in very vague terms about a tariff, it, uh, basically to appeal to Pennsylvania, as I said, the iron industry. But it wasn't a high tariff uh, issue at all, uh, a platform at all. But the core of the Republican platform was what we call Plank 8, which didn't just say we're against the spread of slavery. It said the normal condition of the territories is freedom, the opposite of the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott decision has said the normal condition of any place under federal jurisdiction is slavery. They say, no, it's not just keeping slavery out. They're, slavery is not constitutionally allowed into the territories. Only states can establish slavery, not any territory. So it's more than just keeping slavery out. Um, any place under federal jurisdiction cannot have slavery. Um, and there is a strong plank against nativism, that they welcome the support of our quote-unquote adopted citizens, immigrants. They do not want to be associated with the know-nothings. So Lincoln is the perfect candidate. He's, he's midway between the radicals and the, and the conservatives. He's moderate, but he's acceptable to both of them. Um, he's forthright on slavery, but he can appeal to the doubtful states. Um, or to put it another way, he's conservative enough to win the election and radical enough to set off the secession crisis by winning the election. 